There's this terrifying stat that says that by 2020, a billion salespeople will be obsolete, forced to research. Very heavily quoted stat. It's this big doom and gloom stat. And it sounds dramatic, but really as a salesperson, your edge is your humanity. In a world of automation and in a world of templatized personalization and real relationships, that's your edge. That's your differentiator. Why would you not double down on that? Welcome to the Strategic Momentum Podcast, the show where we share tips, stories, and advice from progressive leaders on what it takes to break through that business inertia and propel you and your business forward. I'm your host, Connie Steele. Today's guest, Aaron Gargan King, best selling author, entrepreneur, and founder of the global social media firm Socialite Agency, has spent years mastering the art of activating audiences online. She's written the book, Digital Persuasion Sell Smarter in the Modern Marketplace. And today, she shares how to get noticed online and positively influence the people on the other side of your screen. Let's hear her story. Well, I started off as a 100% commissioned ad sales rep in Baltimore City, Maryland. So picture Anchorman, who is the guy from old school, Will Ferrell from Anchorman. Picture that kind of ridiculousness at a local TV Baltimore news station, coupled with like inner city Baltimore, like The Wire. It was like Anchorman meets The Wire. That was my life. (laughs) I was driving around trying to persuade everyone from car dealerships to dentist offices to realtors to buy TV airtime on a local television broadcast station. If I didn't sell anything, I didn't get paid. It was the best life training I've ever had. Um, That's how I started my career. And it was a lot of fun. I was working for this fella. He was um, this New York guy. And I remember I walked into his office one day and he's like, welcome to the world of television. He's like, see this phone book? You're going to call everyone in it. And you just keep calling until someone says yes. You meet with them. You show them a PowerPoint. You get the check. Then you get paid. That's your training. Go get them. <laughs> I was like, whoa. So that's where I started. Um, and then you know, from that experience, I uh, ended up doing fairly well, which led me to realize that um, I'm, I'm very good at selling, but I'm not a great employee. So I didn't like having the uh, rules and regulations of checking in and expense reports and all that. So I ended up starting my own company uh, when I was 25. And it was called Jump Digital Media. And we built a websites for uh, small businesses and eventually larger companies. We built landing pages for IMAX, Black & Decker, Whole Foods. And I realized that you know because television was becoming harder and harder to sell because social media had just taken off. So I realized that was kind of the next frontier. So jumped into the media, I ended up selling that to my partner a couple years later. And I started another company, which was called PMS.com. 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 <laughs> it was like it was a dollar shave club for women's tampons. We were called oh. the tampon fairies. Forbes called us the tampon fairies. And it was basically magic a uh, magical uh, period prep delivered monthly. So we got 25,000 subscribers. We were featured in Forbes. I sold that company, which was a, a really exciting um, learning experience. And then for the last 10 years, I've been running Socialite, which is a social media agency specializing in live events and conferences. Um, I now am speaking and writing full time to help brands really figure out how to attract attention, increase influence, and just sell smarter in today's crazy social and mobile marketplace. So that's the short version. So it's interesting that you talked about selling smarter in this day and age, where I think so many of us feel like we're being bombarded on all fronts with various messages, whether it's selling something to us or convincing us to do something, but yet many of us are ignoring it. So what do you think these sales and marketing folks are getting wrong? You know, what are they being challenged with and, and why are they totally falling short in their delivery? Well, if you think about it, social media and smartphones has only been around for 15 years. I mean, do you remember what you were like when you were 15 years old? Yeah. <laughs> Like you're awkward, right? I mean, you're not a kid who's totally clueless, but you are definitely not a mature adult who has some kind of handle on what reality is all about. You're kind of in that in-between awkward stage. And so when we look at the sales and marketing strategies that are based on social, based on digital, based on mobile, they are awkward because they're in a growing stage. The growing pains are evident. And 
when you think about how much time we're spending on our devices and on social, we're spending about 10 hours a day behind screens, according to Nielsen. We are fielding an average of 300 messages coming and going throughout the day. And we're spending about 2.25 hours a day on social media platforms. I mean, we are scrolling and driving, which can be fatal. We are scrolling and walking, which can be pretty dangerous. And we are scrolling and toileting, which is gross. (laughs) So if you think about this, this is our new reality. And yet a lot of people don't realize that the way we communicate face-to-face in person, like you and I can see each other on this Zoom call. I'm responding to your nonverbal. You're leaning in. You're nodding your head. I can see your office. You know, the way we communicate face-to-face is a lot more persuasive, a lot more human, a lot more influential than when we are actually communicating behind just a screen, which blocks off so much of what makes us good at what we do. In fact, a study published last year showed that we are actually 34 times less persuasive in our communication on digital platforms than we are face-to-face in person. And yet, I don't know about you, but I spend most of my time communicating still behind emails and social media posts and texts. Absolutely. Video conferencing is on the rise. Like you and I are are now like, it's a lot more like a real meeting because we're seeing each other. But still, most of the time, a lot of our communication is still written. And we just, we're very different people in that space. And so whether you're a salesperson that's creating messaging to try and persuade someone to give you a chance, or whether you're a marketer trying to create messaging to influence a perception around brand, it's a loud, crowded space with everyone behaving pretty badly. So that's why I think that that's such a big challenge. Consumers and potential clients are bombarded by messages hourly, creating an overwhelming amount of noise. And most of these messages come from screens, not real human interactions. Breaking through that noise means finding ways to connect with your audience in a way that feels human. And Erin explains to us how to create that connection. So what have the experiences that you had in your career journey um, and starting all of your own businesses helped you kind of shape the way you think about being more digitally persuasive today? Well, it was actually a very specific scenario that helped me recognize the difference between persuasive digital communication and horrendous you're getting ignored digital communication. (laughs) It was, I was, my company was about three years old. And we had just moved into this beautiful beachfront office in Laguna Beach. I hired this fantastic staff, our whole office. We called it the dollhouse. It was like Pinterest perfection. We had great killer parties. We had all these great clients. And one Friday afternoon, I was running through numbers from the week. And one of our biggest clients ended up canceling their contract with us. And it was a long story, but overnight, we ended up losing about 70% of our revenue because I had put a lot of our eggs in one basket, even though all my mentors told me, never do that. But I'm like, oh my gosh, great contact. Nothing will ever happen. Lesson learned. So between that Friday and that Monday, I had to fire two-thirds of my staff, several which were friends of mine, one of who still does not even talk to me to this day. Um, I had to basically... um, break my commercial lease on this dollhouse, which is illegal and terrible. And I had to do that. And within 48 hours, I had to move all of our furniture and all of our whiteboards and our desks and everything into my 800 square foot two bedroom apartment down the street. So I took all of my personal belongings, you know, the art came off the walls, went into the garage and the whiteboards went up. You know, in my guest room, the guest bed went down in the garage and a huge glass conference table that barely fit. I mean, there was like an inch on either side went into the guest room and I had to convert my entire home into an office with a small staff and essentially reinvent the business and start all over. So I had about a month of runway for payroll and overhead before I realized that I was probably going to have to shut down the company. And I started frantically reaching out to try and find new clients for our organization. And my messages were the messages that we all send, right? The why I rock message. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I work for this amazing organization. We have clients like amazing person, amazing person, amazing person. I'd like to help you with our services, which are amazing. Buzzword, buzzword. Do you have time to meet with me to learn more about how I can talk about myself to possibly help you on Tuesday at 10, right? You've probably gotten a message like that or sent one like that. So 
you may be able to guess that I did not get a lot of responses to the standard cold email, which everyone sends because it blends in. So I began to, it was, I was looking through my messages and I realized that of all the messages that I got of people trying to sell me things, I had only responded to a handful of reps and given them meetings, whether it was software, insurance, whatever. And I started to look at those messages and I'm like, what do these reps say or write to me to make me stop my scroll, lean forward and give them a shot? Jump on a Zoom call, jump on a phone call, take a look at their white paper or their deck, right? Mm -hmm. And I started to analyze these messages and I saw this pattern that they all tend to have these three components to that message. So I just took what they were doing and I did the same thing and started reaching out, changed my approach. One of the uh, people that I reached out to ended up saying, you know, we don't need help with social media, but I have a friend who's looking for some help. Introduced me. I had a great meeting with her face to face. And that client ended up being uh, the Oscars, the Academy Awards. Wow. And we brought our business in. And from that one gig, then we got hired by Fashion Week. We got hired by Nelson Mandela's family. We got hired by these incredibly huge organizations. And my company roared back to life. And it was all because of shifting the way I thought about reaching out for new opportunities. And so what are the common fallacies that people have when they reach out to folks that they think is successful? It's probably some of the same sales tactics that we always see. Yes. So, okay. In person, we tend to talk about ourselves about 40% of the time. If you're in a conversation at a Christmas party and it's it's like a tennis match, right? You're you're hitting the ball back and forth. But when we go behind screens, there is this phenomenon that psychologists call the online disinhibition effect. And basically it says that because we're physically far away from someone, because we often can't see them you know, from behind the screen. And because often there's a, de- there's a delay in the answer, it's asynchronistic communications. So maybe you send an email or a post, there's a delay before someone answers. All these factors combine to make us more empowered to behave in ways we would never be bold or rude or crazy enough to act in real life. That's why you see your girlfriends that are online dating show you these insane messages or people that get furious and send a terrible email and you're like, oh my God, that was really mean cyberbullying, which is horrible, right? You see people acting this way because it's actually, it's our, it's, it's, it's the way we respond psychologically to be, to communicating in this new medium, right? So, so because of that, when we're communicating online, we tend to talk about ourselves about 80% of the time. So twice the amount of time as when we're offline. And so that kind of self focused approach to communication is the opposite of persuasion. I mean, Dale Carnegie, father of persuasion theory, author of the greatest 80-year best-selling book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, one of his greatest principles says that to be persuasive, you have to try to put yourself in the other person's shoes and see it from their point of view. But online, we're seeing it from our point of view. And so we tend to communicate in a very selfish way, which is the, the kind of the overarching why we kind of suck at it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so in analyzing a thousand sales messages for my book, Digital Persuasion, uh, Sell Smarter in the Modern Marketplace, I looked through a thousand sales messages. And what I found was that more senior executives tend to use the word I four times less than junior executives. So people that had been working maybe like around five to seven years. And so using the word I not only makes it all about you, sets you up to not be persuasive and not think about that person on the other side of the screen, but also makes you seem more junior. So when you look at people saying, I think, I feel, I want, I just wanted to reach out. I was hoping to connect. I wanted to pick your brain. When you leave with the word I, you're automatically setting up the conversation to be really self Centered. And so the first thing I say is that making sure that when you open your communication, you delete yourself. You're, you, you kind of, you are aware of how often you're saying I, because you don't really have to say, I was thinking that. Duh. That's why you're writing it. So just say it, just say what you want to say. And so if you think about it too, a lot of the communication that we look at, Connie, as you know, is on our mobile devices. And so our brains have really rewired in about 10 words, 2.5 seconds, aka the length of a mobile preview, we are deciding important, not important, interested, not interested, ignore or open. And so that preview message is really all you get for someone to decide whether or not they want to engage with you. And so when we waste that preview on niceties that in person are important, like, hey, Connie, oh, you go to Jackson Hole too? Where are you from? Oh, you went to Maryland? All those niceties we had before this podcast, 
it's we're in person, so it's different. But online, those aren't polite. Those are wasting the person's time and they're blowing that preview opportunity. So you're filling up that line with, hi, how are you? I hope you had a great weekend. And you look like everyone else from an inbox standpoint. You haven't differentiated yourself. So what you want to do is you want to start with something personal about the recipient, a proper noun of personal significance to the recipient. Because by just leading with someone, something, or somewhere that that person cares about first, you will automatically stop the scroll because you'll get their attention. It's something about them and not starting like everyone else. How are you? I was hoping to whatever. Capturing the attention of your audience starts with letting go of the me focus. Remove the word I from your emails and gear your language toward them, their interests, and their triggers. Erin emphasizes putting yourself in the shoes of the recipient, and she warns that if you don't understand how they see you, then your message won't be effective because they're already bucketing you into one of four categories, a friend, foe, server, or seller. So think about how you check your email, how we all check our email. I don't know about you, but right now, sitting on this podcast with you, I'm going to show you my screen so you know I'm not exaggerating. Right now, I have 133,377 unopened emails. (laughs) Now, before you judge me, my title is CEO and founder. So I get hammered every day with like 30 messages from everyone in the world trying to sell me things. I can't keep up. I cannot check this many messages per day. On LinkedIn, I get anywhere from 12 to 20 messages. People trying to sell me software and SEO and you name it. And they're all, it all blends together. And so what I'm trying to do as best I can is what I call treading inbox water, right? You're just trying to keep your head above water and not drown. And so people typically are either they're a swiper, you know, or they're a scroller. They either scroll by and kind of just ignore it or they delete, they swipe it and delete it, right? Sometimes Mm -hmm. we'd stop and open it, which is great. So the different buckets is basically in 2.5 seconds, your brain, which is really busy fielding notifications and emails and social media posts, it's trying to protect you and, and make sure you can get onto the next task of your day. It's survival, it's evolution. So our brains have now reconditioned themselves that in about 2.5 seconds, it's deciding this is a person that I'm friends with and I care about and they're important to me. This is someone that's trying to sell me something. They're a foe. I don't want to talk to them right now. Or the brain is maybe undecided. It's thinking, hmm, maybe it could be someone who's a friend or it could be someone who's a foe. It could be a server or it could be a seller. So your brain is categorizing these messages in black or white or gray. And so you want to make sure that when you're opening your message, you position yourself to have a better chance of that recipient's brain categorizing you as either a friend or a potential friend, which is what we call a server. Mm -hmm. And then I think as they start to evaluate that message, you also talk about the importance of how you write it, where you have this formula that you talked about of pub. And that, because a lot of people, when they're writing these communications, it is about templatizing it not personalizing it Mm -hmm. um, so that they don't even realize it's what they're doing is creating a volume play of a templatized email, which immediately will just go into somebody's like delete or, or never go unanswered. And so you talk about the importance of being able to really think about that individual and personalizing in a way that ultimately has value. Because right now, a lot of these messages have no value. Well, you're absolutely right. It's the spray and pray, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, coffees for closers, numbers game. Let me tell you this. In 2018, if you are still playing the numbers game, your days are numbered. Here's why. Because anyone can copy and paste, including interns, including people overseas, which I have gotten so many messages from people overseas that are hired out for you know $5 an hour to just hammer these messages out. And I respond back like, it's been nine unanswered messages. And so what I've started to do is I take a screenshot of it and I publicly shame the person that's sending them. And they'll write back and say, oh, it wasn't me. It was a person I hired on my behalf. I'm like, that doesn't make it any better. <laughs> so if you think about it, also with robotics and AI and machine learning, I mean, if 
AI can do a two hour brain surgery in two minutes. If they can drive cars, I mean, they, uh, recently um, there were two robots at Facebook, Bob and Alice, that, that they invented. And, and essentially within hours, those two robots started speaking to each other in a language that their programmers didn't even understand. And they had to shut them down. I mean, robots are beating humans at Texas Hold'em. If they can do all of these things, I'm pretty sure they can copy and paste. And so <laughs> what is your value beyond what other people and, and technology can do as a salesperson? And there's this terrifying stat that says that by 2020, a billion salespeople will be obsolete, forced to research. Very heavily quoted stat. It's this big doom and gloom stat. And it sounds dramatic, but really as a salesperson, your edge is your humanity. In a world of automation and in a world of templatized personalization and real relationships, that's your edge. That's your differentiator. Why would you not double down on that? And so, so for example, I was working with one organization, Hitachi Healthcare, and their global sales force is about 300 people. And these sellers are very traditional. They're from a legacy organization that's based in culturally conservative Japan. They're selling multi-million dollar pieces of equipment. They have a very long sales cycle, anywhere from six months to 18 months. And they're trying to reach out to essentially use digital to create dialogue, use social to find someone and persuade them to give them a chance, either face-to-face or on the phone to set up a meeting in person. That's the sales process. And so what they found was they were all sending about 50 to 100 templated messages, the fake customized messages, which by the way, never work. Because I will tell you this, I've had so many messages, people saying, hi, Eric, instead of Aaron, I've had them say, we do social media marketing, which so do we. Obviously, they didn't look it up. I have had people literally just write and say, it looks like you're heavily involved in the financial services industry. No, I'm not. I mean, they are literally just putting out 100 messages with the hopes that 1% will answer. Now, here's the problem is that when I worked with Hitachi Healthcare, that's what they, they were sending out a lot of messages and they were only getting a very small response. So that took a lot of time for them to copy and paste. It was two hours a day of outreach with very little return. What we found was when they used my pub method, which is start with something personal, offer something useful, and keep your communication very, very, very brief, brilliantly brief, P-U-B, personal useful, brief. They operated within that framework and they inserted their own unique personality following that guideline. What they found was that they were able to open twice the amount of opportunities by sending half of the messages. So they were working smarter with their time, building real relationships, and by the way, not contributing to the spam crisis, which is wasting not only all of our time, but their time too. So it was really a win-win. And, and the pub method is something that I, I teach in my workshops, in my sessions, in my book. And it's, it's not an exact science, but it's what I've learned in working with all these big brands and in analyzing what works over the long term when it comes to being a truly digitally persuasive communicator. With technology not only dictating how we communicate, but also doing the communication for us, it's easy to forget the persuasive power of genuine conversation. Take the time to invest in writing brief, personal messages versus using automated response systems. You're likely to see a much higher response rate. But how do you craft that perfect message? Can you give some examples of the um, elements of being personal and then elements of being useful and elements of being brief. Because I think sometimes how people perceive that, like say being useful, how can you deliver value to somebody that you may not even know? And so they think by delivering value is still probably very eye-centered. But give us some examples of, of each of those tenets. Yes. So let's talk about how we got the Oscars because that's a great example. So the message that I wrote was personal, useful, and brief. So it was a friend of a friend and I went online and I socially stalked her at an appropriate level. In 2018, a lot of people will use messages to say, I want to learn more about your business. If you could just give me some time, I could learn more about your business. That worked back when I was selling TV ads back in 2004 before social and mobile and digital. Back then that was polite. Like I'd love to learn more about your challenges. Now, when I get on a call with someone like an intern or someone that's more junior and they say, tell me about your business. I end the call immediately because my entire business, my entire life 
is on the internet. If they didn't take the time to look me up and to understand where I'm coming from and say, okay, so it looks like you are involved in A, B, and C. Is that right? So I would assume maybe some of your challenges might be X, Y, and Z. Is that right? Now you have my attention. Now we're saving time. So when we look at for the Oscars, for example, research is the new listening. So if you think about the the social stalker spectrum. Think of it as a Salesforce meter. You have your green zone, your yellow zone, and your red zone. You want to keep your social media stalking in the green zone, publicly available information that people have put out there on the internet. The yellow zone can be a little bit like if you ever see someone comment on a post from two years ago, you know, um, that's a little creepy. You don't want anyone to think that you're going back that far. And then the red zone is showing up at their house. Don't do that either. Right. So you want to keep it in the green zone. So with the introduction for the Oscars, the gal's name was Laura and I went online and I researched who she was. I was looking for someone, something or somewhere that we either had in common or that I could comment on. So do we have any one in common? Do we have any schools, any jobs, anyone that we follow on social media in common? Do we have any where? Is there anything in common at all? So you start there. And typically you can find something. I was on a call yesterday with um, a real estate organization, Keller Williams. And I was meeting them for the first time, faceless conference call, six people. Five minutes before the call, I looked up the lead decision maker. I couldn't find anything on her LinkedIn. All her profiles were private. So I went to page three on Google. What I found out was that her dad was the head coach of UT football for 10 years. One of my best girlfriends just married one of the legendary UT football quarterbacks. And I kicked off with that. It, it set the tone. It was like she was warm. She was welcoming. And we had the best call ever because immediately I established that I had looked her up, been respectful, researched her, done my homework, and it just set the tone for a great call. So for Lara, what I found was that she was from Fort Worth. Okay. Now I'm not from Fort Worth, but my best, one of my best girlfriends is from Fort Worth. So this is kind of two different Texas girlfriends. So a different girlfriend, my friend Meredith is from Fort Worth. And so I just reached out to her and said, Fort Worth girl, eh? I learned how to, you know, put my, put my lips on, get my hair higher, the closer to God. And I sure love going to a rodeo at the stockyards. I just opened with something personal to get her attention. That was about her that she would read. Now, it was not going to make us best friends. Talking about lipstick and teased hair and the rodeo is not going to make us best friends. That's not the point. The goal was just to show her from that opening preview, those 10 words, that of all the people trying to get her attention online today, I was going to be different. I had taken time to get to know her. So that's the personal. So then I wanted to offer something useful. To your question, Connie, how do I know what she needs that's useful? I have no idea. Well, research is the new listening. Figure it out. So I went back through and I looked at some of the things that she was uploading and I saw that she had uploaded a lot of, um, she shared a lot of articles around the future of mobile apps in the event industry, registration apps, connecting attendees, et cetera. And so I figured this gal is probably interested in solutions for how to better run events on social media, maybe some apps that can help her. So all I did after I opened with the stockyards, lipstick, hire the hair closer to God, Texas quip, that was personal. And then right after that, I moved into something useful. I said, it looks like from your shares on social media that you might be interested in learning about this awesome new app that my social media team has used for events to make it easier for us to communicate at scale for a larger company. I know one of the reps over there, they've taken great care of us. Let me know if I can set up an introduction for you. Useful. And then finally, brief. B. Brief is, cheers, Erin. I didn't ask for anything. I didn't ask for time in her calendar. I didn't ask if she would meet with me. I didn't ask for her to check me out. And guess what else that does? Differentiates you from everyone else that's asking for something on the first message, which is not appropriate. So she looks at my profile and she responds back, thanks for the app recommendation. I'll check it out. Two weeks later, I followed up and I said, how's the app working out for you? She said, oh my gosh, thank you so much. That's amazing. I talked to the gal, we're using it. She looked at my profile, writes back and she says, it looks like you guys do social media for live events, huh? We're actually hosting a live event in the next couple of months and love to learn more about what you guys do. Now she's asking me what we do. 
We have a great conversation in person and boom, next thing you know, my little nobody, five people working out of my office in Laguna Beach, California, my 800 square foot conference table banging into the side of the guest room, whiteboards in my living room, you know, scrappy startup, beat out some of the world's top agencies in New York, LA, and London to run social media for the world's largest event. Personal, useful, brief. If we can do it, anyone can do it. With the pub method, everything Aaron preaches is about letting the recipient know you care about establishing a relationship. And it's about being personal, useful, and brief. Yet you have to remember it's both an art and a science. What's critical, however, is delivering value in whatever correspondences that you have. And this means reframing what many may perceive social selling to be. As Aaron will tell us, there are plenty of misconceptions about using social as part of your sales strategy. It's don't sell. Social selling is stop selling. It, it's it's a pull, not a push. It's a it's an entice someone. You know, we live we live in a lean forward culture. You know, for a long time, interruption based advertising like radio and TV and direct mail and cold calls worked because we didn't have social and mobile. People were just sitting around the house like. Well, I don't know how else I'm going to learn about this. Please tell me. I'm interested. But now we live in a lean forward society where we are searching. We are, we are directing our own experience from A to Z. We search what we want. We tune out what we don't. And so interruption-based advertising is becoming less and less effective. Two-thirds of millennials have ad blockers installed on their phones and their computers. They don't respond to ads. And so this idea of cold calling, this idea of you know, back then there was no other way to know who needed your services. There were, of course, I was calling a hundred people out of the phone book in 2004. How else was I supposed to figure out someone that's interested? You had no other, but now it's like, oh my gosh, if only there was a place where we could find what people like who they know, who they follow, what they care about, what their companies do, what their competitors are doing, what their challenges are. If only there was a place we could go to know who to approach in a realistic, human, helpful way. Uh, yeah, there is. It's called the internet. Why aren't we using it? <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. But we also, you know, we get stuck in our patterns and, and I think change is hard. And, and people um, that come from that generation of learning that it's a numbers game, learning that 10,000 follow-ups is the way to get things done. A lot has changed. I mean, business has changed more in the last 15 years from social and mobile than it has in the last 1,500. I mean, it really has. And, and so I think that as people just at least become aware that what has worked for a long time doesn't work anymore. And the way that you are in person is maybe not how you're acting online. And just being aware that this online disinhibition effect is not setting you up for success so that you can at least start to fight back and start to overcome the challenges that most people don't even know that they're not doing a great job with their emails and their messages and their posts. But you know, and now that you know, you can't unknow. So it's really up to you if you want to try to be a little more personal and lead with them and not you. Try to offer something really useful. And no, more information about you is not useful. What's useful is to offer them something of value so they feel like they want to reciprocate. They feel a little bit indebted to you. They might go check you out and then boom, they're at your profile. How shoppable are you? Is your deck there? Is your video there? Are your customer testimonials there? Make yourself viable as opposed to always trying to sell. And then keeping it brief because our attention spans are so short. People hate reading. Look at the rise of emojis. We do, I mean, you can have full conversations, praise hands, you know, emoji wink face without even using words because our brains are so tired of reading. So keep it brief. You know, when we write from behind screens, many of us tend to repeat ourselves. We tend to restate the same thing. We tend to go on and on. Anything more than one scroll on a mobile device, my friends, way too long. Cut the copy, show, don't tell, and get to the point. Because in person, that's rude. Online, that's respectful. So what would you say to all those people out there who are constantly connecting to folks on LinkedIn and wanting to be part of their network with no context at all? Well, the personal useful brief works very well for this. The best way to connect with someone that you have no context with, can you find anyone in common? Okay, maybe the answer is no. Anywhere in common? Maybe the answer is no. Anything in common? Maybe the answer is no. Okay, 
and start back at the top. Is there anyone that they care about that's important to them, that they have shared something about them on social media that you can comment on? I have gotten meetings with something as ridiculous as commenting on how cute someone's dog is. Okay. Because that's not like changing the world. We're going to be best friends. But there was an author in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of the New York Times best selling authors of all time that I had been dying to meet with. I read all of his books. He helped me in my sales career. I had his book dog eared and underlined and tattered in my days at Baltimore City, driving around to car dealership to car dealership, trying to sell TV airtime. And this guy was one of my total heroes. And I looked him up online and I found his Instagram was open and he had all these photos of his French bulldog. So I just wrote and said, your French bulldog is the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. Now, I didn't know him at all. I was just commenting on something that meant something to him. And he wrote back and we engaged in a dialogue. I ended up having coffee with him. He ended up having me on his podcast. And I just sent him and his uh, fiance a wedding gift years later. So you just never know how being personal and useful and brief, no matter what context you have or don't have, can ignite a relationship that can unlock opportunities beyond what you could ever imagine. And also being authentic, whatever that is for you. The word authenticity is tossed around a lot. It's used often. And your authentic self, Connie, is not my authentic self, is not the listener's authentic self. And so owning who you are, being comfortable with it. And there is a certain element, particularly when you're online, it's not that you shouldn't care how you're perceived, but you should be confident in if you always telegraph who you really are, you will always win. Because there will always be haters, especially online. Because if you talked about people feel more empowered to behave in ways they wouldn't behave. So people that are making negative comments on your post, people that are maybe not being that nice, they're maybe not happy. They're maybe jealous. Who knows? They're hiding behind their screen and they're taking their issues out on you. It has nothing to do with you at all. So feel, you know, be brave and be courageous enough to be yourself, which is really hard when we're judging ourselves by likes and comments and shares. You know, this, this currency, I mean, you can't define yourself by how everyone is responding to your content. You just have to come from a place of service, do the best you can and have fun. That's great advice. Now, of all the experience that you've had from your personal experiences leading up to your professional experiences and having done this now for some of the biggest brands in the world, what advice would you give your younger self I would tell my younger self to try ideas on a smaller level first before diving all in. So if you are listening to this podcast and you have entrepreneurial aspirations, learn from my mistakes. Test on a very small level before you jump all in. My first company was called Jump Digital Media because I just jumped into it without really any plan, anything. And it was tricky. I mean, at one point I had to put payroll on my credit card. I had legal troubles. I learned so many tough lessons, sleepless nights, losing my hair, you know, just making mistakes because I, I, I jumped in at scale first. Try something. If you want to start a business, if you want to try a new initiative, test it. Try a little teeny bit and just see what happens. Make sure you have a working prototype. Make sure you have some key indicators that from a data standpoint that this is going to maybe have legs before you dump all your savings into it or all your heart and soul or you hire all your friends or you get that expensive office. Try to ensure that a little bit works first as insurance to set yourself up for success and then take that risk, but take a calculated one. Sounds great because it certainly sounds like when you started sort of that second incarnation of your business, you know, you are researching, you're testing, you are learning along the way. And based on those, you know, insights, and then you were able to pivot, it catapulted you into this incredible momentum that you have today. Exactly. So, um, yeah, and I think that's tough because if you have an entrepreneurial spirit like you, Connie, like probably many of your listeners to this podcast, we do, we are a little more. We're not as risk averse as the average bear, right? We we are more courageous. We are curious, and there's a lot on the internet and on social and on TV that really glamorizes the entrepreneurial lifestyle, right? Quit your job, four hour work week, Shark Tank, follow your dreams, be your own boss. It's very sexy and it's very glamorized, and all of that is definitely true. I mean, I'm completely unemployable at this point. I literally, no one would hire me because I have not had a boss for so long. I don't even know what I would do. However, I had to like really learn some tough lessons. I mean, 
you know, like lawsuits and money problems. And, and now my business is thriving and my team is happy and healthy. And I sleep eight hours a night and I get to go just surfing and spend out with my family and my friends. And life is great now, but man, like people don't talk about those first couple of years where you are literally not sure how to make payroll and you can't sleep. And so if you can make smarter, smaller choices, you can kind of skip that part and just go right to the good stuff. And what is the best way listeners can connect with you? My website is eringuardianking.com, E-R-I-N, G is in girl, A-R, G is in girl, A-N-K-I-N-G.com. Or my Instagram account is my primary social channel at Erin Gargan King. Digital persuasion starts with creating an authentic human connection. It's about demonstrating to the recipient that you care about them, not yourself, and are committed to establishing your relationship. When composing your emails and marketing materials, remember the pub method. Be personal, useful, and brief. Put yourself in the audience's shoes and deliver a message that you would want to receive. As Aaron says, it's about pull, not push. Authenticity over grandeur. In a business world crowded with bots, you want to be the real person who delivers real value. And then you could grow your sphere of influence. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. You can connect with Erin through her website, eringuarganking.com or on Instagram at Aaron Gargan King. If you've liked what you heard, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, leave us a review. This is what helps others find the podcast. To hear previous episodes or get show notes from this episode, you can visit us at flywheelassociates.com slash podcast. And don't forget to follow Strategic Momentum on Facebook and Instagram. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.